Hello, welcome to Arc Studio Presents. I'm Micah Craddy, a screenwriter and the head of writing at Arc Studio, which, as many of you know and use, is a screen uh, writing app. Uh, and it's great. And you can check it out at arcstudiopro.com if you want. And I'm going to post a discount link in the chat uh, for showing up today um, and joining us. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to bring Pamela Ribbon on stage. I'm very excited to chat with her about writing animated movies, which is um, an area of the industry that I don't know that much about. So I'm excited to hear what she has to say. But just one um, quick announcement before, as people are still joining us. Um, tomorrow, we're doing uh, Write With Us. Uh, tomorrow afternoon at 1 p.m. Pacific. And I'm going to put that uh, event link in the chat. Um, if you haven't done right with us, basically every Wednesday at 1 p.m. we do um, timed writing sprints together. So you bring your own project, you work on it, uh, and uh, we chat a little bit about writing to the break during the breaks. We then put some music on, and we do uh, yeah, just timed writing sprints. And tomorrow for the first time we're going to have a guest, which is really exciting. Uh, writer producer Annie Julia Wyman, who is the co-creator of The Chair for Netflix, and she's written and developed for HBO and FX and Hulu, um, will be joining me. Uh, so it should be pretty cool. We're going to be uh, writing on our own projects during the sprints and then chatting about writing and answering some questions and stuff about screenwriting uh, during the breaks. So please, yeah, show up to the tomorrow if you want to get some writing done during the day. Uh, please click subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to know about future events. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'll try to work them in as we go, but I won't be able to get to all of them as we go. And if we have time at the end, we will uh, answer more. And now, uh, without further ado, please put your virtual hands together for Pamela Ribbon. Pam, thank you so much for joining. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad. I love your little podcast studio that you have thank like you. set up with I'm like a professional walls. Yeah, I know. This, well, I have. First of all, I'm on your podcast. This is I'm a professional podcast yes. person, <laughs> but then I have a podcast. So here we go. That's but right. Also, you have your own podcast, and you also like you were just like a guest host on Script Notes last week, right? So mm -hmm. you, you're you're popping up all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's my dulcet tones. <laughs> you know, it actually does sound really good. I have a, a microphone, but what I need to get is like the the arm like setup that you have. Um, so we're yeah. it's like just like in um, a good uh, positioning. A little out of the um, way. Pam, thank you so much for joining uh, me to talk about animated movies. So for those of you that don't know, Pam was nominated for an Academy Award last year for her fantastic coming of age animated short film, My Year of Dicks, which is amazing. And like, there are a few scenes from that film that live in my head forever and I will never <laughs> forget. Um, is it is it online right now? Can people watch it? Yeah, you can go to myyearofdicks.com. Awesome. Uh, I like be right there. I highly recommend checking it out. Checking it out. It's such a fantastic uh, movie. Thank you. Uh, and she's written for Moana and recently Nimona for Netflix, Ralph Breaks the Internet. She's also written for sitcoms. She's a comic book writer, novelist, essayist, and roller derbyist, which <laughs> is another form of creative expression, I think, all in itself. That's true. Um, yeah. By the way, is roller derby, like, is it dangerous? Are there are tons of injuries. <laughs> I don't know that anyone has ever asked, is it dangerous? Well, it yes. just seems like dangerous. Yes. When you watch it, you're actually probably watched people get hurt repeatedly. Right? That's that's funny. Because it's dangerous. Um, yes. It is, yeah. Yes. You get hurt. It, it, you definitely get hurt every and time. The perfect timing for this. My neighbor's gardener has just shown up. So I'm going to pop off screen for like two seconds to shut okay. my door. Okay. Yeah. Uh, roller derby uh, is a violence. It's a controlled violence sport. There are um, rules, but yes, you you definitely. It's a full contact sport. Um, yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I've never done it, but it always looks fun. Uh, although I'm not good at uh, roller skates. I feel like if there's like, is there? Can you rollerblade or do you have to do roller skates? Like, uh, I I think it's quad skates. For okay. the most part, um, on flat or banked. I'm sure, listen, whatever you want to do, Micah, there's someone who will help you do this. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. that. Someone will help you. Um, I'm really excited to talk about animated films because, like I said earlier, it's an area of the industry I don't know a ton of, about. But I think for me, like a lot of people, 
kind of our first introduction to cinema is through animated films. A lot of like the first movies that people fall in love with mm -hmm. were animated films. For me, I must have watched, you know, Aladdin and The Lion King on VHS, the back in those like Disney, the white kind of thick bubbly packs with the VHS uh -huh. tapes, just like um, a thousand times. And like, I know there's, you know, so many other people who, depending on kind of what decade you grew up in, there were those classic animated movies that were important for you. I'm curious, uh, were there ones that were very important to you in your formative years? Uh, um, a lot of them were not Disney films, but yeah. but for a Disney film, it was uh, probably The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Oh. Uh, and then I also watched often The Secret of Nim. Yes. Um, that one's yeah. scary. Like, yeah. I remember that one. Like, I, I wasn't always in the mood for that one. Like, I had to be feeling brave uh, to watch The Secret it, of Man. It was uh, creepy. All those Don Bluth films are a little creepier. <clears throat> like, but, but I didn't watch, like, this is not an animated film, but I didn't watch, like, The Dark Crystal. Like, Muppety things were not. Yeah. I mean, other than Sesame Street and The Muppets, that was great. But puppets or stop motion or claymation, like, all that stuff gave me the creeps when I was it, it, because it was like in the uncanny valley kind of things like it was too close to being lifelike or what about i don't know that i found any of it lifelike perhaps that's what it is like you know yeah. it was like the tool video <laughs> like it was it's all it's too much davy and goliath all of that it felt it felt a little like uh these things shouldn't be moving <laughs> it felt like stranger danger every time yeah that's, that's how i felt like oh i shouldn't see this this is not okay that's funny. Um, so as I mentioned, you have done so many different kinds of writing and you've had a lot of success working in the animated world. Do you see yourself as a writer who tends to write a lot of animated projects or in an animated writer uh, in your head? Oh, I'm a writer who writes a lot of animation because I do other stuff too and always have. And in yeah. fact, ended up in animation because I had an independent film script that, that Pixar and Disney liked and and that's how they they brought us in I say us like writers that's how they bring writers in um you know it's a director driven studio they have a project that's you know often a couple of years in before they invite a, a writer to start kicking around story and make a treatment and such so uh you know I don't even know that I think maybe now there's a way to go how do I grow up to become a writer at, at one of these animated studios but that was not the case traditionally you know they didn't have writers they were the storyboard artists wrote the story within within the studio and created it together so hiring a writer is is kind of a later addition that came i think you know you can trace things back to no doubt earlier than but the first time i was aware of the concept of this was michael arndt on on toy story you know and, and or toy story 2. <laughs> am i doing yeah. that correctly or first toy story I think the first Toy Story. The first Toy Story. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it felt like it. Toy Story sort of changed the game in a lot of ways in terms mm -hmm. of like how these stories um, were being told and maybe what the audience for some of the stories um, was. Like the there sort of seemed to be like that Pixar magic of like the adults and the kids watching. Um, yeah, but I also think with Michael in particular, you know, if, if you've ever heard his talk on, uh, you know, endings and act ones and, and all of that and like, lessons learned from Little Miss Sunshine directly into how, how to craft an animated film. Um, I do think that that was a, a bit of the indie space, the indie sensibility of storytelling influencing um, an animated world to where you could have these big giant animated worlds and have mm -hmm. complex characters with heart and comedy coming at you in a way that you were not quite expecting. Um, ironically, like the most expensive independent film of all time, which now is Barbie, right? It's yeah. like a very expensive independent film at its heart. Yeah. If you took all the Barbies out, that's an indie film that that did, you know, that it could did. have also okay. been animated. That, that, yeah, that did okay. Um, it did mine. Yeah. So as because like you mentioned, you, you write a lot of different things. And one thing I find is that like in writing different kinds of projects, you sort of get a different satisfaction or you get to play in different areas or use sort of different tools for them. In animated uh, writing, is there anything in particular or are there things that you love about that particular format? Uh, well, you can, well, there's, there's the collaboration aspect of it that is 
great because if you're ever feeling like, oh, I'm not sure about that, there's someone to talk to or someone who knows all about it or someone who really would love to just sit and chat with you about it for a while. So mm -hmm. that happens in animation in a way because you're all working together for so long and you get to know each other and um, there's that. Um, writing in particular, I think you get to um, be f free of having to figure out who this is for because mm -hmm. it's for everyone. So you have to think about how to make your very personal story relatable and universal. And if you can keep doing that, that's just the secret. I mean, it's a secret to all writing, honestly, but yeah. in animation, it's what, it's what you notice in the difference in great animation and animation that felt like, well, they sure told me what to think, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, or perhaps you don't let yourself go all the way in and watch that film. You don't let your inner child free to, to sit and, and wonder. Um, yeah. And I think, I think that's the, that's my favorite thing about writing for animation is your, writing to everybody's inner child. That's cool. I mean, I think that's always interesting, like the idea of like universality and how how you get there in the sense that, because like the more general you are, like you, on, the, on the surface you think, okay, like try to keep it as general as possible so as many people can relate to it. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really seem to work that way. It's like you have to find those, the specificities that somehow feel universal, like tapping into that inner child or the, I don't know, the wants or the fears that that people have that sort of make it feel, you know, universal, even though none of us have necessarily been in that specific, or not all of us have been in the specific scenario um, that that you're writing. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just agreeing with you now. Yes. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. So you kind of, you, you give a little hint at like how you first kind of got on the animated scene, but I want to kind of ask the, the, the dreaded but obligatory writer's journey question. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. How did you end up writing animated films? And was that something you were always trying to get to uh, or did it just sort of happen uh, organically? No, I came up in um, I have an acting degree. I came up doing sketch and improv comedy in, in Austin and, and directing and writing one act plays and things like that. Uh, but with a always with a comedy focus and then moved out to L.A. It was one of my last of my group of friends to come out here and was doing sketch and improv and um, got into a uh, variety television and sitcoms like network sitcom um, rooms. And while also writing like features, just trying to get into, just trying to break in. Um, so I tried to break in in every way. I had a, a website that did well. I wrote online for various publications. I wrote a novel that was a, um, like a version of my website because people didn't really know what, like the word blogging didn't exist yet. So wrote a book about a girl writing online. That was my first feature sale. My first TV sale was adapting my second novel. Again, like that's not the fastest way to break into this industry, <laughs> but, it, but it worked for me. And uh, that very first screenplay that I wrote, um, you know, did well in festivals and um, had some interest and that is the script that eventually ended up over at, at Pixar and Disney. That's cool. Uh, um, we've got a question. Uh, what, what was the book called that, that you adapted? Um, the, if people want to check it out. The first book was called why girls are weird. Uh, the second book was called why moms are weird, but then I didn't keep with the franchise third book going in circles about roller derby, which I did, did sell first that to, Hmm? Why roller derby was weird, or is right, that I should have, but no, we called it something else. It should have been why skating is weird, or something, but whatever. Yeah. We moved on. Um, yeah, I have four novels, and then the memoir Notes to Boys is what became my year of dicks. So I would say most of anything that I've been able to get sold, I had to turn it into a book first, mm -hmm. and it's again not faster but then it's your ip i mean you're dealing with the publishing house and all of that but all all but one is that possible all but one i did option at some point all but one of my books were um, all of those or any of those how much as you were writing them were you thinking about adaptations or optioning or that was it just this is this and yeah you know, something that i don't about. i don't because it's too hard because even even one of the one of the novels, I had written it about halfway through. 
I think, no, actually it started as a screenplay. And then I was like, no, I don't think it is. I think it's a book. And then I got about halfway through and then it became a book about, oh, it became a book about roller derby, but it wasn't when I set out. Um, so I don't know that I want, like, it has to be its thing. It, it, you can't write the screenplay going, maybe this will be a series. <laughs> maybe it won't work and I'll turn it into a series. And yeah. I think a book is the same thing. Um, now I have taken like ideas for pilots that didn't work out and try to figure out like, maybe I can turn that into a comic book. Mm -hmm. Um, and then knowing like, and then probably that comic book would then become the TV pilot that I didn't get to make, but that isn't the goal, but getting IP definitely was like, I know if I write this book. I don't do this right now, but at the time I haven't written a book in a while because I've been busy. But if I, when I'm writing the book, I do think, you know, books don't sell very well. They don't pay very well. So you're doing it for two reasons. One is I have a piece of material that exists and it's out there, which as a writer, that is all we have. Like we're making things that live on. We're lucky in that way that our audition lasts <laughs> as many lives. Um, and then the knowledge of, but if I do get to set this up somewhere, that will actually probably pay the money to help me to have made that time. It'll keep me floating until the next time I finish a book or something like that. That's what a lot of the balance yeah. is and having a longevity in this business is thinking financially six months ahead, a year ahead, two years ahead, while you are chasing things that have no guarantee of paying you or that you get to stay until the end of. Um, and that part can get really hard. And so in moving, this was, you asked how to get an animation, but that no, was this is great. I mean, I think people like, this is like what, what follow up I wanted to ask about that is sort of in the same sense of like how in your career, have there been periods where you had to work out you mentioned like making it last, getting the next point. Have you had mm -hmm. to do over the years work that isn't screenwriting in order to, you know, last until you can get that next, you know, uh, or, or writing of some sort, you know, uh, not, not, not in a long time, not since I first moved out here and spent like, not until my first book came out, I had sold the book, but it didn't come out for like another year. I sold no. it to Simon and Schuster to ask someone's question earlier. So, and then that didn't launch me of like, now I'm Candace Bushnell. <laughs> like, it didn't, like it wasn't like, I, I just wrote the new Bridget Jones. Like none of that happened. So, uh, but I was able to work in a bunch of different, I was, I would balance four jobs, five jobs, but I did that. I've been freelance as a freelance writer since 1999. I've been a freelance writer for wow. some time. And there was one stint when I first moved out here uh, where I definitely was like taking adjacent jobs to the career, but not but I was like a terrible assistant and I was working as a logger in reality television. So was I still in the business? Sure. Um, no, but I've been, I have been fortunate that I've been able to either look ahead and save or, un, or know where it was coming. Um, but because in animation, it's not uh, almost always not writer's guild. I also had to take writer's guild jobs so that I could keep my insurance and my healthcare and my pension. So that also kept me in a more than one job at a time situation this, this whole time. Are you a natural multitasker or is that stressful for you to, to balance all the different jobs? No, I'm a, I'm a natural multitasker. I procrastinate with other jobs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, yeah, yeah. That's if you ever want to like make progress on one project, start a second project to procrastinate from, it's and then true. you can come back. And it's true. You're like, look at this thing I'm not getting paid for. I love it. I'm going to go write this other thing that doesn't, that has no future. But it is, you know, you have to keep some part of you that's free. And then I think mm -hmm. you also have to keep some part of you working that is um, in the after of whatever it is you're doing right now, because you don't know when that job could go away or fall apart or or be too hard and you, you have to know like what's next, not just financially, but creatively, intellectually, physically, what, what am I going to do after this hard day or after this tough six months or whatever? Cause sometimes yeah. these jobs are really, really, really hard and you don't have the, you know, you, you can't leave. You're, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> so how do you get through it? Yeah. Did you, when you, when you have all these different jobs, do you have any sense, like in retrospect, looking back to like 1999, like 
in retrospect, does there seem to be any rhyme or reason or plan to it? Or, you know, at the time, I'm sure it felt chaotic and crazy, but like, is there a progression to be seen looking well, back? I mean, it's weird. I feel like my, my career is uh, Benjamin buttoning in terms of t what I'm talking about. But if you just say, what was her first book? Why girls are weird. What was her last thing? My year of dicks. Like I probably definitely have a lane and a theme yeah. that has emerged through Moana and Nimona and Ralph breaks the internet of, um, you know, what is going on in a young girl's mind and why does that seem confusing to everybody who isn't a young girl perhaps you haven't listened because <laughs> she's saying it in like six thousand different ways all the time yeah uh so i don't know that like i and i've i've written a lot you know i was trying to think of like writing early stuff about myself um early scripts were a little based on family and things like that. So I, I think I am always writing from the inner child space, but an inner child who could be 25 at some point, you know, in, in that first novel, I'm definitely writing about, you know, why girls are weird. Like, what is it that it, which also opens with a chapter about Barbies and what we, how we played with them, which it's was all, like a essay all, that went viral. In the early internet, yeah, I it is all kind of connected, but I think what you know, whether it's making funny cat jokes or or um, talking about why you'd want to sail far, far away from the only home you've ever known, these things come up. Uh, I moved around a lot as a kid. Mm -hmm. I went to thirteen schools, so um, found families really quick missions like you get in and you, and you fall in love and you get out I think is something I'm I'm used to doing my whole life and it it translates well in in this industry That's cool. so jumping ahead a little bit uh, in the process how did you get to that point where now you're writing animated films uh you mentioned there was a script that got yeah. noticed. there's a script that got noticed and I started taking meetings at Pixar and and Disney um you know, they only made one movie a year, two movies a year. So, you know, you come in and you meet and then they're like, all right, we'll call you next year. So uh, it took a couple of tries before we found a good fit um, on what what was Moana. But uh, yeah, I had, I had met over, I had met on, uh, it was pretty early meeting on Inside Out and uh, Big Hero 6 and stuff. So, you know, then when I came in, it was, it was, it was time for a, almost, two years on Moana. Wow. In that process, how much of a, of a learning curve was there for this specific, specific format of, uh, of filmmaking? Uh, well, it, the, the, the specific format of story breaking and writing, I was ready for because I'd been doing sitcom rooms for so long and it's very close to that You're, but it was just instead of 22 episodes it's one pilot that nobody sees that you can't talk about for like four or five years <laughs> that you're just going to keep destroying and building again so that is the learning curve of getting used to this is a moving train and you're gonna try things over and over again and you can't get attached to much but you have to stay very passionate about the project you have to as the writer really be in charge of the scaffolding mm -hmm. because it's there's so many people working on it in all these different directions once it's out of like table read and into any form of um you know in an animatic form for screenings that is a learning curve but you can be a writer and then not really get too close to the animation process because the development and the writing is so early in in that that you could get rolled off mm -hmm. <laughs> before you really see too much fully fully animated. Because there are there are a lot of writers on these projects, right? And they're sort of coming in sometimes to do different things at different times, solve different problems perhaps in the story or? Well, I think there's burnout, but okay. the, and there's also just the notion of uh, the writers are freelance. You're not in-house for the most part. Mm -hmm. So who can you bring to the table in the, highest level of your creative world that doesn't rock the boat too much within your studio it's new writers so you know you're not it's it's a lot to move a director off a project it's a lot to move a producer off a project and you might not have cast it very much yet so you don't have you know actors in there 
talent doing the, what they're doing yet because they tend to do it once it's time to record. So your your writer can you can replace with a new writer and hear like a new it's a it's a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Is is one way to go about it. Also, you know, they're not WGA. So you can do these kinds of things where it's like we're just gonna we're gonna bring in another writer and, and see how far that goes. Hmm. Uh, so I would say when you hear, oh, I was brought in for a week or so. Um, yes, sometimes we're all stuck and it's like, why don't we bring in a writer to come and talk to us or a, a group of writers to come in and have a story room. But for the most part, your project's got a writer or a writing team that is holding the relay baton through that part of the race. And and sometimes it gets passed off to another writer. Gotcha. Um, I want to go back to, I kind of want to go through the whole process so uh, of creating animated films and, and the writer's role in that, starting with the beginning. And by the way, just to remind the chat, if you have questions about screenwriting, particularly about animated films, please feel free to ask. We'll work them in as we go along and save some from the end. Um, in live action movies, you know, oftentimes there's IP or something, but sometimes it can be an original pitch or a spec script that the writer has written. Is there any of that in animated movies or is it all kind of coming from the, the studio? Uh, you in mean terms of the origin of the ideas or, or like, is it, you know, if, if you have a, if someone out there has like a spec script for an animated film, like, does that have a shot at getting turned into an animated feature? I don't or, know. I, okay. I would, I mean, it's uh, dependent on how the studio operates and these things can change. I'm sure if you have a killer script that people are talking about, then people are talking about it, they're going to read yeah. it. Um, I just, I know from my experience, a lot of times it's director driven and they have come up with an idea or they've acquired a book and, hey, we're looking to turn this into an animated film um, and we're putting together a team. So it's it's pretty rare that you get to come in with a, I've, I've created an animated world for you. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, if you're, I don't wanna say it, it's not possible because sure, sure. anything is and, uh, good scripts find find their way you know right so in the process like who, what's the cast of characters you know in a live action you've got writer director producers execs um and then in animated you have animators and and, and other kind of perhaps people and like what is the cast of characters and what are their roles in in the process and how does it differ from live action or or is it the same which is it the same well uh you have I mean, it's a lot like a TV room, except instead of being in a room with other writers, you're in a room with all the storyboard artists who are going to start boarding the sequences in the script. And so you're working on that together. Then they're to, it just leaves the page faster. Mm -hmm. And unlike in live action, you don't just get the one shot and then you have to fix it in post. Like you have all kinds of ways to try it visually and, and recording and, you know, with your scratch players and you're in, in the room, you're playing with the story and then you put it up in, in a, in a screening in its animatic form, which looks, you know, it's like a film. We always say like, if only like if it, when people watch it focus group wise, they're often like, it's going to get, you're going to put it in color at some point. Cause mm -hmm. that's how fleshed out these are with, you know, great temp actors sometimes um, and score and sound effects and everything. So they're, they're made to be watched like films and then and then they get torn apart and you start all over again. So then you're also, you know, you're making a lot of that in edit too. You're together and watching how it works. And but now you have someone where you're like, oh, I wish, imagine if you were like, I just wish I had one a shot where she was like looking at him when she said that. Now you do. Now you do. It exists. Yeah. <laughs> so how much of the, I guess, you know, in the sense of like coming up with an outline or the story, is there any separation between that and the animated or is everything happen happening simultaneously? Like how much discussion of the story and what the movie is happens before people start drawing things? Oh, I, years. Years. <laughs> years, years. Because uh, every time you add more people and more work, it starts to cost more money. You start a, a ticking clock and then you have to get it you know, greenlit to, you know, that hopefully it gets on the slate somewhere and then that changes things. You also have a studio that has a group of artists that are going from project to project. So does this movie have a bunch of the storyboard artists or if it's even closer to production, 
or closer to release, like all the animators are over there. So how much bandwidth does the studio have for this project, this project, this project? And all the ones in development are kind of like hanging out here waiting, like, are we good enough to come down to the runway yet? Um, and that that is, you know, a lot of things happening at once to to take a film from development into production. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the, the, the story development stage, is there, are there any tricks or techniques or if there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen, you know, how do you end up with a, you know, a cohesive story, you know, that has a through line, not something that sort of has everyone's hands pulling it in, in a different direction? Well, it does have everyone's hands in it. And also it looks like it just always existed if, right. when it's, when it's working and, um, it erases all the <laughs> the fights and tears and and the this would never like all the never like you, then you see it working and you're like that's how i'm sure that's how it always was right that's what we right. all agreed upon we knew this was going to happen uh yeah i mean it helps to have a leadership who has a vision that is has a target that you can hit that someone who knows what they are looking for or, or a team you know that's the it's not in animation in particular. It's usually not just one person and they're aligned and you know how to service that vision, whether or not you're, you know, in edit or character design or a writer or a storyboard artist that you're like, I get the tone that we're doing and I get the story we're telling. Um, yeah. And everybody gets pitched on, you know, pitched and brought on as they're onboarding. So, uh, that's just the nature of animation is there's, you cannot do it alone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's also interesting because it feels like in some ways it's unlimited because you can have anything theoretically in, mm -hmm. in the movie. So, which I, I would imagine at, in, at the same time is both liberating and also terrifying in some sense, because there's no boundaries, you know? So how do you, keep yourself focused or disciplined within that like notion that like we can do whatever we want right here. Yeah. Well, there's time and there's money. <laughs> Those are the boundaries. Yeah. There's time and there's money and that's it. You're going to run out of one, if not both uh, at some point. So, um, yeah, I think you, you end up with boundaries anyway. And so you, you find them, you know, you think about something like, Ralph breaks the internet like well they're going to be on the internet what does that look like what does that mean what are walls are there walls what is, are there wires and so once you're able to understand okay this is what the video game world looks like we know this we've established this so now we're going to take it to the, what is a version that lives within this film's understanding of how things work how are we making the internet happen and that's not on me thank goodness it's not on just me like it is not on just me there are so many people who are at the top of their game who have research it and bring in all these different versions and you look at all the you try a bunch of different ways um which again is like the best and the hardest part about animation is it's extremely collaborative and iterative and yeah it is a each one is its own marathon in that process, but a question here, uh, what is the character design like? How many designs does it take until the final? I want to kind of expand that to like the design of the character itself, but also like what is the character development process um, like? Is it the same as, as, as in a live action film or are you're also sort of, you know, develop, what do they look like and what are their limitations and how, what's that process like? Yeah, well, there are there are character designers and artists. This is a, there's a whole department. So yeah. there are people who do this. Um, but when you're writing, I'm trying to think of like early, early things like coming up with a character that maybe wasn't already in a treatment or something, you know, that you have a board of a character and you have kind of their, um, you know, comps kind of and, and traits and uh, in particular in animation, I think we often work from, reference you know in the case of moana we were we were all in polynesia for weeks at a time and interviewing people and taking pictures and hearing stories and we had a oceanic trust of scholars and um academics and people who were there to make sure that what we were doing 
was authentic was their story being told, not our story being put on them. Right. So character design is, was all the way back to that of, you know, Maui is a character throughout the Polynesian islands. They all have their own version of Maui and who he is and what he does and did or didn't do and what he represents. So how do you find a character that satisfies the, not satisfies, but honors and mm -hmm. is uh, that, all of these different island cultures would all relate to and be proud of, mm -hmm. and then make the whole world go, I like him. Um, so an easy task is what you're easy saying. Easy task. And that's what I'm saying. Like, thank goodness. Back. Yeah, you, but we did, you do. I mean, hopefully, but it seems, I mean, you, it helps to have the rock go, I'll do it. But like, yeah. you, yeah, you have to hope for all these things to align and then. And then, yeah, his design changed. His design changed whether or not his tattoos could move or where did he have hair and the size of him, the, just the space he took up. And then also the things that he did or did not do. And that is not, you know, we weren't doing Oppenheimer. Like it was, <laughs> there's no one to ask. <laughs> there's nothing, there's no books. So you have mythology and, um, and then you also have like the way that, this studio makes their characters and the assets that they have and the tech that they're using and the tech that they're trying to advance that by the time this movie is coming out, where will the tech go? So Moana's hair was a whole thing of how you could make it. And, you know, at some point it's very expensive for her to have free flowing hair. Right. Hair is like the, the, it's always the challenge up. of animation, right? Because it's like, you know, it's a, it's a million independent strands potentially moving around. Yeah. Hair and water. So, um, oh, Moana so had its work. Cut out for yes. In the character design, is there like a bit of a feedback loop? Like if the an animator's like, oh, he's got a hook. And then is the writer like, oh, he's got a hook for a hand. Now he can do this. And then the animator being like, oh, what if we did this? And you, is, you know, is it kind of, does it go back and forth in terms of like feeding creatively off of each other? Totally. I only thought of a feedback loop as negative, but I hear what you're saying. Positive, <laughs> feedback. Positive yeah. feedback loop. Um, yeah. Well, that's what I mean by it's collaborative and iterative. And, um, you know, sometimes you're not in the room where they're talking about the thing. And then you come back and find out, like we had a two hour meeting on trees. <laughs> this is the tree. <laughs> this is what it'll look like. And then you're like, well, while you were in that two hour meeting, I was in one where we cut the scene with the tree. So <laughs> go back and tell the tree person, we're sorry. Um, but is, are there also like a sub meeting about the leaves on the tree and absolutely. like the bark absolutely. on the tree? And absolutely. Bark. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. I mean, so, I mean, I think, I mean, in some sense in all filming, you're making, you're creating the world, but often you're taking a thing and being like, okay, this is the house we're filming in and we might augment it, but yeah. everything is being created. So, I mean, I, I just imagine the, the the amount of choices made in the process is just ample, is magnified. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, so it helps to have someone who really enjoys that process of looking at 347 different types of wood for a table that is in the scene, but like not, there's no character named table. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But like, they're still having that meeting. And then you also need the kind of person who's like, you know what, I think number seven is going to be great. And we're going to keep going with number seven until someone is like, do you remember 347? I think that's the table we need. And yeah. th this balance of can we just try it? And but can we think about this a little bit longer? Is I think where it's not my favorite place to be in animation, yeah. but it's certainly what does allow forward movement and so it's like you need it's it, a decision is more valuable than like whatever the decision was like just having something to move forward it's with. just like why you have to write your first draft you don't yeah. have anything you have not written anything <laughs> you have to finish it then you have a thing that you can decide what's it going to be and what should i do with it and what how to kind of make it better but until you have finished that draft you have you have not written a script Right. So you don't have a movie to be working on like it, it, because there are five to eight screenings of this film, you better get one out there. <laughs> you have so far to go. Um, 
Well, you mentioned Moana. I'm just curious. Uh, someone had asked a question earlier about how, in terms of the collaborative process, there's also you know animation, but there's music and there's these mm -hmm. songs which have lyrics. And so lyrics are going to have to tie into the story somehow. Are you, how much of that do you know in advance? Or are you like getting a song and be like, okay, we have to make this song fit uh, <laughs> into this somehow? Or, and not well, so just long in general, but like, I guess musicals, you know, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I can't speak to how all the processes work or even sure. what it's like to do two of these. <laughs> so I really only know. Yeah. What happened? I mean, I can imagine a world where you're given no. Okay, I did work on a thing where I was like, "There are songs here. Are we rewriting around the songs? Are we keeping the songs, or are we for a second saying we're putting the whole thing on blocks and then building from the beginning to decide do we still need songs in this? And if so, are these the songs? That was where that place was in development. And you got to be delicate with all of the stuff. But in with Moana, it was always going to be a musical uh and but i was there before the music team had been assembled so in that case i was writing um spaces for songs places where we felt this is probably when she's going to be compelled to sing and i want song this is a real establish the world moment here's how maui will get introduced and i wouldn't assume i'm a lyricist but i i would try to write both the stage directions and stage directions so my theatrical background but I, I would try to write both what what we were seeing and what Moana was saying to feel like what could be a song I would just get a little more lyrical in in the way that I was describing what you what you saw and and, and imagine the emotional there's there are certain emotional beats that the story needs to be hitting yeah you know, at that point to make it all and then for Lynn, he would be like, I can make a song out of that feeling. Like, oh, that's such a great feeling here in this scene. I think it should be a song. And so your your scene would go away and, and a song would get dropped there. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, you, so you mentioned these animatics, these screenings. What are what are those like? Uh, because I mean, so like one of the fundamental differences is in live action, You someone writes the movie, then you go and film the movie. And maybe some things are changing a little bit during the process, but generally it's like, you have pre-production and production in animation. It seems like that wall is almost completely dissolved. Oh, well, I mean, you know, people have their friends and family screenings before picture sure. lock. Imagine that it's exact same feeling and the exact same kind of screening, except there's about 400 people who watch it and they can give you a note that might make your act one and act three go away. And you can just keep doing it because you're just doing reshoots. <laughs> you're just doing reshoots because it's not um, you up often, you're, like, which is why it takes a long time before you put something in production because it's much harder to stop that train and say, we're going to, we're going to pull all of this back. It's been through so many different um, getting ready for production places that it, it's, you, you really wouldn't want to stop it unless you absolutely had to, and that does cost time and money. So, uh, yeah, a screening is like, oh, I was going to say like a staged reading, but it isn't like, it looks like a film. It looks, you're, you're sitting down for 90 minutes. You're watching the film. Sometimes there are like placeholder cards. Let's say there's a big action sequence and we haven't had the time to do all of that work. So, you might hear someone say like in this scene, you know, Moana's at the reef. But for the most part, you try to make it feel as close to, let's sit down and watch this movie. Is it working for you? Do you like these characters? Is the theme coming through? Um, and yeah, are there characters that are needed or you, we don't like? And it that can go on screening seven, eight. <laughs> like it can really- How often are, are characters coming and going from- uh, I imagine with minor characters more than with, with major characters. Minor characters for sure, but or or a major character takes up too much, you know, and you're like, we've got to give some of that to someone else. But usually it's minor characters going away. There's just too much. There's too much going on. It's a lot of like answering early questions. Why is she like this? And what happened? And where was she born? What are her parents like? Does she go to school? And then later you're like, oh my God, can we get to the movie? <laughs> you're like, right. Remember when you asked all these questions because we had gotten to the movie too soon. And then you get rid of all that act one extra stuff and 
the audience doesn't miss it because it's because by the time you meet that character, when you cut all that other stuff, she is so fully baked that all of you like that's our that's what we know it took to get there. But you didn't have to see all of that because now she is so strong because we do know all these answers. Is the process of the, you know, the addition, the subtraction, the, the feedback, the multiple rounds, um, how does that feel to you as a writer? Uh, is it exciting to be making it stronger and sort of knowing you're going towards a, a, a common goal? Or is there a mm -hmm. feeling of frustration of like, uh, uh, we already did this, guys, or like, can we, like, I thought we were good. Sure. All of it. Both. Yes. I mean, all of it, not just, I mean, that's any writing, that's not just yeah. animation, but it's like, yeah, it's exhausting. And it's, un it, the only thing that's predictable is there will be notes. And, you know, you, you have to care every time. And you have to also, I guess, figure out how to care for yourself while you're doing all that. That's, that's a bit of the trick. Hmm. Because you, you just, you know, you're, there's something in you that is making you say, how can I help you see this? How can I make this better for you? How can I make this better for everyone? And then at a certain point, you're like, I am tired. <laughs> right? So you have to know those moments where you're like, oh, I have to, uh, I have to step away from this so I can see it again. Or mm -hmm. I have to stop talking for a minute so that you can hear me again. Because if I'm talking too much, you're, you're starting to tune me out. Uh, because I just sound like someone who said something you've heard a bunch of times. <laughs> In terms of the nuts and bolts, during the, the story breaking process, are you guys doing whiteboards, you know, mm -hmm. sitting in a room, kind of like what a traditional writer's room you mentioned, there's there's mm -hmm. parallels, like writing on boards, yep. index and, cards, all that moving stuff around, all that yep. kind of stuff. All of that always, the whole time. And then sometimes you start having um, visuals, like beats from prior screenings or they're making moment paintings they're called like when visual artists are starting to see what that world could look like or that character that moment that dynamic and we'll put those on the board because those help with those like emotional milestones hmm. temples emotional temples through through the story we're like well we definitely want this moment so if it's moving around does it still feel good if it's happening earlier or is it going to feel better if we put it later uh, but yeah, it looks like any show's writing room, except just the one episode. <laughs> one rather large jumbo, jumbo mm -hmm. episode. Mm -hmm. Very special, very, very special episode. Yes, that is in production, but still doesn't have an act three. I mean, <laughs> I've heard of some studios where they're just going forward and making the movie and in production and they don't have it. It's not finished yet. They haven't mm -hmm. finished writing it, but they've run out of time. So they're writing it, which I guess happens in live action but in animation you're a little like oh. <laughs> you guys should finish it. how do you know what it's gonna be they like, don't know yeah. yeah so what is the actual script writing process like then you mentioned working with the animators are you mm -hmm. is it being written um sequence by sequence or do you have a full script um and you know then the animators sort of get involved uh, what's the process yeah, yeah, you start with a script, a whole script, a full, a full script. So you have something I mean, again. I don't know about that other studio, but you, sure. start with, you start with a full script. It's not like okay, here's the first few scenes. Animators are writing them. We're adjusting. Okay, now we move on to the next few no. scenes. Later, when you've run out of time, mm -hmm. uh, you may not be able to ever get back to okay. I have a draft, and you're just everything is broken into the sequences, and you're adding sequences and removing them, and they start getting named interesting names and numbers but genuine generally then when there's a screening then you true up a script and then that's the screening three draft and we're working from that mm -hmm. um because you do go back to you get to screening five and you're like you know i miss the villain from screening two like do you think we can bring that back and work that into the studio this story where it is now because i like our character dynamic i don't think this antagonist is working how much can we and and so by the time you get to your final screening a lot of times you're like it's both exactly what that first screening was and has little bits of everything along the way that we learned to make ultimately this version that feels like what we set out to do to begin with mm -hmm. um but is you know totally different and has thousands of artists 
hands on it. And so it's, um, it's impossible to imagine what it could be yeah. from where you started. Yeah. When you're crafting the scenes themselves in the script, are you approaching the actual scene writing differently in an animated film than in a live action film? Are there things that are unique? I think I, I read or heard an interview. You said mentioned that like characters can't stand still in an animated <laughs> movie. Sure. I mean, they can't, they don't like, <laughs> we think they're frozen. Right. Um, so, you know, that's not, I don't, I wouldn't write in a script. She keeps moving her eyebrows or whatever, right? Like, I think the difference in writing for animation is you just have to ask, why am I animating this? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it is a live action script. How cool. Any of this that can happen in live action is awesome. If it can't happen in live action without it being impossible to produce or, you know, either financially or technologically, you have an animated film on your hands because the fish are talking, right? Like, there you go. The so fish are talking. It's We're simple. animating this. I yeah. cannot, we can't, how would we make the fish talk? It's not going to look right. Um, so, you know, that's why you have boss baby as an animated film because in a, in a commercial, they only had the money for so long. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I just love like the thought of, you know, for something of someone just being like, can we, can we teach the fish to talk, you know, and yeah. then just in, be like, no, okay. Just getting to All the right. end of that. I guess we'll have to animate it. But, we're gonna but have to, you know, guys. will yeah. it look, will it be too scary in live mm. action? Uh, you know, you can look at the, where animation is used in documentaries. Um, it is sometimes to protect a, a, an anonymous mm. source but it is sometimes used to make us have enough of an emotional distance and an intellectual distance from what we're learning or what we're experiencing so that we don't feel the peril and the grief. Conversely, animation can also put you in a place where you feel the peril and the grief of, of, of an entity, because it could be a fish, that you would never normally have empathy for because you've never been immersed in that world the way that you're going to now. So I think that's, also a benefit why would i animate this well i'm i'm trying to be in two worlds at once with you yeah and i want to be in your your little kid space that is ready to learn why are we who we are and i want to be in your grown-up space that asks what can i do about this and or how will i parent because of this or what what kind of friend am i going to be after this um and i think anim animation really captures that place where people aren't they don't walk in thinking this is what's going to happen to me but then they they walk out like <laughs> you know what i mean like they walk out like oh, yeah. when you're when you're trying to calibrate that how much is the i guess visual tone or the feel of the animation changing i mean is it like okay this is too scary we need to change the way it looks or is the, the feel of the movie kind of solid or, or constant throughout the process uh in terms of like you know the 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 style of the animation can yeah. greatly affect like is this feel scary or not you know like and so is the in terms of the character design of the world or the tone of it is is like the style of the animation changing throughout the process or does it sort of end up looking or feeling like it did at the the start of the process I guess, is there a calibration going on? Well, that's not really part of where I am, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of like my year of dicks where here's a place where I had this op, this, the opportunity to be involved in that part of the process. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there were times where we're like, I think this part's too scary and it's too scary, not because of the animation style, but because of where are, um, who has the point of view right now. Mm. And so what the audience feels changes because we're being told, feel, feel, feel for her, not with her. And so then it can be scarier because you are thinking only about like what she should be doing or what she should have known or what she should learn already. But if you're doing it with her and that doesn't mean you're changing the style. It honestly, in this case, it was music. We were mm -hmm. like, well, can we fix this music? Cause right now the way the score is going, it doesn't change when her location is changing. So it isn't her score. It's the, it's the score of the show. Mm. So can we make it her score? And then we know this is how she's feeling. This music reflects what she's hoping for in the scene. 
And that's not changing the animation at all, but it is changing completely how you experience that animation. Uh, so I think that that is probably more likely how tonally okay. you shift. Cause it's, I mean, Disney's going to make their things look like Disney movies. Right. <laughs> like there's right. not like, Oh, that one's so different. And even when you did some, we did something like the princess scene for Ralph Bracey and we're talking about every other princess that's ever existed. It had to be through the lens of how this film looks at a Disney princess yeah. on the internet. She came from the internet. So what is that? Um, you can't just have like actual Elsa and Anna, like walking through this film, it would break. For, for my year of dicks, when you guys were coming up with the, the, the style, mm -hmm. what was that process like? Were there uh, sort of different concept drawings of we could go in this direction, we could go in this direction and, and feeling out what felt right? Well, I saw Sada Gunnar's daughter's work and I said, I love what she's doing and I, I want to see if this can be a match. And she had read the scripts and had put together like a mood board for me of all of like images and, and photographs and, and things. I had not seen it. So I saw it after we started working together. I was like, I love this. But um, she read the scripts and thought about artists and friends of hers that she thought could really nail those genres that were in the script and then thought, and I think for the, for the fifth chapter, we'll all work together. But the, but the real life Pam, she would handle in her style. Um, and then, and that, that's how that went. I mean, she showed me the work and, you know, the portfolios and things of all of these artists. And mm -hmm. then for each episode or each chapter, when it was their turn, we had a, a long meeting about, you know, swapping ideas from this genre and influences that we had both, um, at, you know, we weren't all the same age. So it was like, where's your vampire story? Like, where do you, where do you get your gothiness? And then like looking for iconic moments in other films that we could reference or, and, and, um, and put together that feeling of, you've been raised on pop culture and now you're out here just, <laughs> just seeing what sticks to you and your body. Um, and just knowing that like it was awkward and vulnerable, even when we were having these little meetings of like, so this one time I called this boy and I did this thing. And the more that everybody came on board with that feeling, I think you can, you can see it in, in the way that the, the way that the style moves too of like, we're all a little awkward here. Um, that had to do with the rotoscoping, but it also had to do with their decision of how they were going to work together and what kind of line art they were going to use down to like the software they were using. They, they worked together to figure out that um, congruent. Am I saying that correctly? Sure. <laughs> Once in a while you're like, here's a word. Here's a word. No, <laughs> like what my brain said to say. I'm just, I'm just talking. I'm just having to say yeah. things right now. And I don't, yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're if you join us late, we're talking about My Year of Dicks, which is uh, Pam's uh, animated short film that was uh, nominated for an Academy Award, and um, highly recommend watching it. MyYearOfDicks.com, uh, and it's it, variety of animation styles and just like a phenomenal story. So that's what we're talking about, and you should check it out if you haven't seen it. It's so cool. Um, and I think it's just like it's a, it's a great just in terms of animation, like it's such a great example of what animation can do. Like the, the scenes that I'm thinking about that are, um, like you said, can this be done for real? And there are things in that, that can't be done in live action. They're an animated thing. Yeah. And, and that that's just perfect. And you're like, Oh, finding a visual metaphor for this emotion or this experience right now. Um, is just like the encapsulation of kind of, of like what animated uh, film can do. And as a, and as a writer in 2D, it was the complete opposite experience of what I was used to. So this was a 2D independent mm. animation piece in short form instead of a CG, right. 100 million giant studio conglomerate situation of, of IP, existing IP. So in this case, we recorded first. I, we cast it and recorded it. We had not finished an animatic at all and i was like what are we recording and they were like the the film that you wrote and i'm like no i just wrote that that's not what it is and they're like it is what it is and then we're going to animate this script you wrote why is this confusing to you and i was like this is so this is it like this is it what if what if we need to change something and they were like i don't know what you mean <laughs> 
that's not how this goes. We don't have time or money to change anything. This is it. Like we had one line that we did some ADR for because we just couldn't, we just, well, oh, it was the Big Bird monologue. It wasn't working. And so there, that was it. Bree, who plays Pam, like drove up from where she lived in Las Vegas to here to my my house. <laughs> In to this very room, no, this very you're... room yeah. where I worked on both Dix and Nimona at the same time during a pandemic. Like, I don't know what it's really like. I just know that, like, working here in this little corner with uh, artists from around the world that I totally respect is a great way to make animation <laughs> in 2D or 3D. Yeah. Well, we because, actually had a question about yeah. you your preference of 2D or 3D animation, um, do you have a preference or does it feel different for like one is more appropriate for a certain style um, of animated film? I, well, I mean, it, it, to me, that question is, do you like working in the big studio system or mm -hmm. do you like working independently? Because no big studio is making 2D stuff. I mean, like a side and in, in stop motion, but not like, you know, not the same thing. Uh, I just, again, like I'm going to move around and, and, and work with people that were having like a good time doing good things. And I, I try to be bendy, you know, you don't go to 13 schools without being someone who knows how to like figure out a room and be a little flexible and uh, see the good in each, in each spot that you're in and, and hope for the best. Um, I wish that 3D animation had more variety in it than it does, but we're also, this is where it, this is that technology is doing that. And so maybe in 2D animation, you get to see so much more of a variety of ways to do it because it's more, you know, hands-on and it's more hands-on and not, <laughs> and not numbers. How does, cause you, you, uh, how do the comic books you, uh, work on has that influenced your animation writing or has your animation writing influenced the comic books uh, at all yeah i mean i started doing comic books well one of them i definitely started before i was working in animation so i would say that what i what i figured out was like oh i'm i'm storyboarding that's how i'm writing these graphic novels and these comic books like i i draw them out first all the pages because that's how I know the joke is going to land at the bottom of this page. And then how many panels? And then that's how the scripts work. You're like page eight, six panels, how, how the panels go on the page and then panel one and you describe everything that's happening. So um, I think they got easier to envision and I had more confidence going into comic books once I had been working in animation and just had more familiarity with talking visually with people mm. you know when you're writing your script and you talk about your script you talk a lot about beats and characters and themes and midpoints and rising action and when you're talking to visual people who don't have to use any of those words and what they do you're like okay how 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 can i make this make how do i learn your language so that i'm not just trying to make you understand my language um and a lot of that helped when i started pitching with visuals and it's if it's giving you a, a character to look at even if it's um a comp or whatever like it invokes feeling and then you can take them on that emotional journey mm -hmm. without having to be like am i protagonist like it, i just stopped using those words um if i didn't have to you know and and that that helps a lot that's great. What what is? How do you feel drawing? Do you, are you comfortable? <laughs> like your your art, yeah. artistic level? No, I do. I mean, I remember when they are all doodling the whole time. It's just mm. nothing but character caricatures of each other, mm. and so you you learn not to like hold your face in a way. Like I'm looking up because I know I have a couple like above me of caricatures that have been drawn of me. They're like, "This is you eating salad," and you're like, "Great, <laughs> that's right. thanks." It's Thank immortalized you. for all time. Love it. Uh, um, but one time I was doodling and one of the directors was like, writers don't draw. That's one of our rules. And he was messing with me, but it like, I was like, Oh, I bet. Oh, I bet. Like, how dare I? So no, I would, I, and as I've had to be in more of a position of, of pitching, definitely like I can draw a couple of circles with some angles and be like, it's a two shot, you know, but I'm not going <laughs> to, 
I'm not gonna be like, I'll take this sequence. Like no one's asking me. I wouldn't even know. I I I don't even know how to spell Cintiq. I just know it's a thing <laughs> that people use <laughs> to make their storyboards. Um, you mentioned the ADR and the, the voice recording for My Year of Dicks. Mm -hmm. For the larger studio productions, is the writer involved during the recording? Like, are there um are there alts in the sense of like, yeah. you know, the, the 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 mouths need to match up? So how like how much <laughs> Are they reanimating <laughs> something or is it no, just like you need but, to say it like this? No, no, no. But you just reminded me of one of my very first jobs, which was uh, taking an the Japanese translation of anime and mm -hmm. writing the dub scripts where I did have to count mouth flaps, as they're called, and then give a line oh. reading. <laughs> horrible, horrible flaps. Oh. flaps, mouth flaps. It made it to where I couldn't watch animated films. Like I couldn't watch spirited just, away i remember yeah, when that came out counting, like, like, yeah i'm counting i really yeah. was counting oh. so that went away eventually but uh yeah no you're in the room i mean in, in terms of something like ralph breaks the internet there you don't have the whole cast there so you're reading off of you're reading with them sometimes in the booth or you're collaborating with them to get some alts or you have you're, you're just supposed to you know you write one on the fly like that's a lot of uh, multicam television experience coming in or, or even, yeah, the variety comedy stuff, just knowing like you're here and you're listening and you're pitching alts and you're ready to go. And, um, yeah, and because that's all going to happen before. And then, and then that continues all the way on to at the end. Yes. There's some ADR that you come in and do, but not, not big, hopefully, hopefully nothing, to where the mouths aren't matching like i any adr i did was off of like the character's back or something you know so if you're doing so but if they're doing recording alts you know mm -hmm. and then you're like oh we like that alt then the animator has to go in and well you haven't or, you haven't or, animated you're not so what, are they, what are they looking at or are they looking at anything they yeah we uh, have the storyboards the storyboard. you, okay this is the thing like animation and then the storyboard the storyboards are hand-drawn line drawings of you know of sequences and animation like then there's layout there's design there's all this stuff before then i mean animation is like at there's one point where everybody looks kind of naked because they haven't done this fabricy part which is someone else's like that's another team right there's crowds these are all different teams then lighting and then whatever so the process of animating is long and and then it goes to get rendered and then i don't think you try to mess with it after that but so it's i'm talking like it's past my knowledge you know? at that it's the storyboards that are getting changed around as you go perhaps and then when it's like in that you have all these teams all over the world perhaps working on it like it's it's locked down it's going to cost a ton of money to change stuff at yeah that point, right? yeah yeah and maybe then you've held a little bit out of production the last stuff that's going into production is the stuff that is still getting worked out a lot act act one stuff or it this was a really big 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 scene and that is going to take some time great yeah. uh, i want to work in a couple questions here this is a great question from chantal mm -hmm. uh, curious about the art of writing a joke that gets a big laugh from both parents and kids i think this ties into what you were talking about earlier type going into that inner child for everyone yeah uh well like you can't predict it really mm -hmm. but you can have a good sense and then uh like i don't know i, I keep going back to ralph just because that one is well because kids aren't going to watch my ear of dicks they shouldn't they not shouldn't. yet depends on what you call a kid what's but the, what's the age what's what's the appropriate age for recommendations for it if you are someone who is a a, a teenager or has been a teenager or is someone who is like yeah, that's the age. Teenagers or having been a teenager. But then I also think you're mature, like a mature 12 who is embarking on uh, sexual identity and pleasure and expression and love. Like, okay. Like, I, that seems okay. But anyway. But it was the 90s. So set yourself. Set yourself up appropriately. Maybe have a friend to watch it with. Um, uh, but so let's say like something like um, there was an app that my little, little, when my kid was very little that she used where you were like feeding a dog or you were feeding a cat, these different like foods 
And that was the whole game. And she would just play it for hours. And it just uh, to, uh, it made me laugh to think of Ralph and Vanellope getting trapped inside one of these games where you pancake or milkshake and you feed the cat and then you feed the bunny the milkshake and you just and that he's just like, you know, seven hours later, he's still like, this is the best. Why would anyone do anything else with their life? And that made me laugh. And that uh, made the room laugh. And then that is why, you know, like a kid is going to laugh. It's very silly. It's very basic. It's very human to be like, cause you know, you've certainly been like this dumb. I've never, um, <laughs> Oh, I've just, I've beaten the game. <laughs> like I'm three years older now. So we all know that feeling. We all know it. We can laugh at Ralph in a situation where he's doing this. And then, um, and then my directors were like, also that, you know, they're, we're going to blow up one of those animals. Like that was, <laughs> that was the next step that they took of like, you know, where can you also get a gross out factor? Mm -hmm. That's also where you're like, you know, if you're not, all like I think I was the person who was like, how many poop jokes can we remove from this script? <laughs> I'm aiming for ten, but I also have been in the position where I'm like, it needs a poop joke. So that is part of it of like knowing how serious have you been for a second. So how mm. silly do you need to be now to let us breathe, or how serious can you be because you've earned it from this level of sophisticated silly of like we're talking real things and we're being real characters we're being human even if we're fish to this moment that then becomes universal and and often it is just like it's human behavior yeah yeah um sp speaking of Ralph breaks the internet that so that you know you came on that as a sequel is what's the challenge like of taking a character you know it's already had a journey in the first movie and mm -hmm. then like now we're going to take them on um another journey is it just a question of digging deeper or finding a new path yeah i mean people do both right so in yeah. this case yeah though because if you've done your job well in the first film your protagonist's main wound has been healed and therefore they really don't have much to complain they shouldn't have much to complain about we just spent a whole movie with you fixing all your problems yeah. um what so, else do you need what else do you need you whiny baby so and that's why some people do the dark origin story second. Uh, and I th think when you're not going to do that, you want um, you want people to come feeling like I'm going to sit down with this group of people I care about. Sometimes they're fish. And uh, I want somehow to have the same experience with a new story where they make me feel the same things I felt the last time, but in a new way. And then when I leave, I'm like, can't wait to see the next thing they're up to. That's a little bit the beauty of episodic television. Yeah. But in this case, you have to make it be a big giant story, a big giant story. So in Ralph Breaks the Internet, that's why it was like, oh, this is really what's going to happen to Vanellope. That she, has, she hasn't arced from the first story. And so Ralph's got to learn how to deal with the fact that sometimes your friend grows past you in some way. And what do you do about that? Uh, so it is still his story, but it is her, it is her big arc that, that was unresolved from the first movie. Because mm -hmm. you couldn't have him need a friend again. But it is ultimately what ends up happening. He thinks, you know, his position as a friend is is uh, shaky this then these new influences come in and the internet is faster and poppier and maybe more for her and you know he's grabbing at those things and is, is he going to smash this this cart too because he's you know he's definitely done that before so you have that feeling of this isn't this isn't the same movie at all but i but you know how these characters are going to act they do still have that moment where you're like oh ralph how could you do that to her and, but it's a totally different story. Awesome. I want to try to work in some questions now. Uh, we have some time here. And some of these are more general screenwriting. Some of them are more animated. Um, do you feel your background in improv helped you a lot with comedy writing? Yes, totally. Absolutely. And, and not like pitching, uh, doing Q&As and podcasts. Like my improv background is used every day in all the time. Parenting. <laughs> I like, noticed you you've, okay. yes and, you've yes anded me a couple times on the <laughs> podcast. You're just like, yeah, on this interview, you're just going it's, with it. It's true. I mean, but it is. Otherwise, if I was just like, no, I don't know, no, like, where are we no. going from there? Like, all right, uh, great. Uh, okay. Let me look at my list of questions and try mm. to talk. 
but uh, yeah and it's also it helps in comedy but it it helps in drama too honestly like improv skills tell you hang on nothing is nothing is real nothing is here so what do we need mm. and what are they hoping to feel next so that's you know you're creating it together improv is collaborative too so, I mean, <laughs> hopefully you're not alone up there <laughs> just like but yeah, so it's that knowing that give and take of improv is whatever room you're in, you're reading a room, that's improv, you know, so uh, being nimble and trying to have a good time about it, even if even on your hard days, where everybody wants to kill everybody else in the room, you're like, how do we get through this day? And usually it's by finding something funny. That's great. Um, another kind of craft question here. Um, similarly, what are some type tips on writing clever dialogue? Do you wing it? How do you do it? Um, I, I think you can kind of take this in terms of writing dialogue any way you want. Um, do you have any specific approaches that you go through and, and how much does your dialogue, I guess, changed is the dialogue in your first pass more just sort of like, this is what I need the beat to be. Or are you like, no, this is how it needs to be said. Um, well, I'm finding the character i'm finding the character mm -hmm. so that might things may change and you may get to the end of the script and be like now i know this thing that that she says or she does and i'll i'll put that in a little bit earlier i don't know that i've ever written something or i've sat around and gone how can this be clever or how can i make this clever but i think clever comes out of knowing you are in familiar territory with the script you, with the scene you have to write a breakup scene mm -hmm. okay then how is this scene in this film, unable to be done in any other film that has ever existed or will ever exist. And that is where you find the origin of clever. I because have to do unique, this one differently. The unique ingredients of these characters in this moment, in this world that no one else can replicate. They are boundaries. Yeah. They are boundaries that help you find the freedom of what they would say, because they are not any other character in any other film so that's you know really knowing your character's point of view which is where great dialogue comes from is knowing that these people are talking about the same thing or fish are talking about the same thing but they're going to talk about it differently because they have a different lived in experience and so they come at something both thinking i'm right here so how do we have this conversation how do we break up because i know i'm right <laughs> you, you seem to think you're right Right. So we're going to figure out how in the end we're going to have one of us not happy and one of us probably not happy either, but the victor. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's so important just to know what your characters want in the scene is that so you can put them in opposition and, and find the, the conflicts that are going to really spark. In and, and a lot of comedy comes from what they want in that scene isn't actually what they want mm -hmm. in life. So now you have a character in a, situation where they're having to behave unlike themselves and we know that and comedy can come from this like here i go having to be outside my point of view be outside my goal be outside of uh who i am and the and the mask i wear i'm having to change it for this moment that's where a lot of like comedy comes from of, awesome. of watching someone have to because you have to be vulnerable in that moment awesome this is a great question. What are the most challenging things when you collaborate with the writing team and discuss to take the best decisions of what is right for the story? How do you land on and find that together? Uh, time and money. <laughs> time and money. It's the answer to all things. But uh, yeah, it's challenge. It's just challenging. What is right for the story is knowing that this story is what it is today. Like this helps, right? We're going to move forward because... Today, the story is this, and this idea you have is a great one, but it doesn't fit today's story. And it may fit, and it probably fit the story we had before, and that's where your brain's still working, and that's fine too. Hang on to that, because we're going to be there again. We're going to have this problem again. I can already tell. So hang on to that one. And then sometimes that's you telling yourself, like, yeah, when we get here again, I'll bring up this and maybe it will make more sense or feel right because we've moved some other things around. And now what I'm seeing is working for everyone instead of just me, because I can't see the the problems that they can see. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I feel like for myself, sometimes I feel like I, I you, you get, in, I don't know, I get invested in my own idea. Right. And mm -hmm. 
where at the moment you have the idea, it feels like the best idea. And then you can sort of be like, okay, these are things have changed. Like you mentioned this, it may not be the best idea, but I still love this idea. I want to fight for it and having to be like, but circumstances have changed or this isn't, you need to care about the project in the common goal more than like your own idea winning out. Um, yeah. I mean, what, you know, your great idea ends up tanking the screening later and you've been walking around like, I made that idea. And now they certainly remember like, whose idea was that? Oh, the guy who said it was his idea like 300 times. Yeah. There's also like, I've certainly done a thing where I can see something and I've pitched it quite passionately, but I didn't have everybody with me in the pitch. And I didn't know at a certain point that I had not like that some people weren't following. And so it ultimately isn't a pitch that's successful but someone heard it. And so later, again, when you're in that moment, someone will be like, didn't you pitch kind of this like six months ago? And you're like, yes, here I go. And you don't remember exactly what you said, but you're hoping you, you certainly remember the inspiration of what it was. And you're like, I think it's this. And I feel like it could be this. And now, now the movie's ready to hear it because yeah. you have tried some other things that didn't work out. And this one that was maybe going to take more time, more money, more work, more like shifting around act one because it's a great idea for the end of act two. But we didn't want to have to touch all that stuff <laughs> because we couldn't because some of it was in edit and some of it's here or it's in production. So yeah, like things find their time. I think, yeah, the timing of the idea, that's such a fascinating concept that like there is no right or wrong. There's what works in this moment and you may need to wait. Uh, I mean, like I know I've been like in rooms where I pitch something that I like just thought died because nothing was ever mentioned about yeah. it before. And then just a few days later, the next week, you know, the showrunner or something being like, all right, so we're doing this blah, blah, blah. And you're like, Oh, that, that worked. Or like someone will pitch it again because it came back around because like now is the moment for that pitch. Not, yeah. you know, when it first came And up. it's, and it's hard to stop feeling like you are supposed to put flags on all your ideas because at first you feel like this never happens and now it's happened. I got like that. They thought something I thought was smart. Like, yay, I'm going to tell everyone. I'm going to tell everyone. And then later it becomes the thing that they're like, this one thing is ruining the whole. And so you're like, I'm sorry. Right. So learning later, like the earlier you can learn, like it doesn't matter because there are so many of people's little flags that that's mm -hmm. what makes it great. And you know, if, if Moana works, it's most people don't remember that she's not a real person. <laughs> right. So they're certainly not being like, are you the one who, and also I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like, well, that one sentence, like, sure. Is it great to have someone say like that idea you had is smart and you're great. And I think you're awesome and all the things you, but there's also something in a movie that is in 44 languages and all around the world that there's a beauty in being able to, to really step back and away from it and not try to parse out what you did or didn't do and not care about any of that stuff, but just let it be a thing that exists the way that you said the Lion King at the beginning. And you were really talking about the case that held your Lion King. Like you don't, you weren't like be, written by, directed no. by, like you were like, and then the it sat here on my show. The I sound of the clan. That's, that's right. What's going to stay with you. Yes, you're remembering like songs and moments and feelings and your family and popcorn. Like these these movies are bigger than any person or group of people who worked on them. And for something to live through generations and make people name their kids Jasmine, like you just get out of the way of that. And I find when I'm asked to talk about well what what thing did you do here i'm like man i i know some things i said but the years that it took to get to the screen after what i said involved so many people that i never even met that i'm not i can't speak to the final film in the same way even nimona which had a shorter period from when i left and when it exists like oh my god the amount of work and blood, sweat, and tears that went into that film, I, I am impressed it exists. It's 
it's different for something like my year of dicks. It's smaller. There's my face. It's my story. Like I can tell you all day, where do these things come from? Um, because I am talking about my life in that, in that film, but everything in the other animated worlds, like we created worlds and we created the characters in them. And, and what a, what a gift that it gets to be human anonymous a little. I mean, the studio is going to do what it's going to do. Cause they're like, no, we did that. <laughs> we put all the money. So sure, we did we, that. We chose our money. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that's, um, that is a beautiful place to end. Um, I will ask you one last question, which I sure. think is the, the obligatory parting words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I think that just to say that, you know, you are speaking to an audience of screenwriters, maybe mostly aspiring screenwriters who, who want to write things that they, that come to life you know, on the screen. And it is, you know, a very challenging, difficult process with emotional ups and downs. So um, yeah, well, what would you say words of encouragement or, or parting words of wisdom? Well, see how much you can make it on your own. Mm. Like how much of it can you make without at hitting that place where you need someone else to read it, vet it, approve it, pay for it. Like we just have a lot of ways to make your own stuff now and you don't always have to live in LA to start your career and all kinds of things that are that are different now uh and don't be alone and and find community and find other people to talk to go to festivals go to go to workshops go like get yourself yeah, I a writer's group yeah you can form a writer's group but then it's that can be like a really small room you've stuck yourself in so I'm saying like let your community be bigger and go see things, go do things and talk to people because uh, the one thing that is always true about writing, no matter what is you are alone. Even if you have a partner, like at some point you block everything out and go, I have to write this down. So you live in that silent, quiet you space too much. You just do to get the job done. Um, so when you're not doing that, make sure you, you, you come up for air both in a world that has nothing to do with your writing and in a community that would love nothing more than to nerd out with you for hours about what it is that you're working on. They're both equally important for longevity in this industry so that you can learn. It's not just you. Everybody feels this way. Everybody, however you're feeling today, everybody feels this way and it won't stop. So if you hate this feeling, you may not want to do this for a career. <laughs> If you hate this feeling, stop calling it your career and let it be your hobby and then see if it feels better that way. If it's just something you like to do. But if you don't know how else you're going to go on, if this isn't what you do, then you need to meet people until you find the group of people that you're going to start doing it with. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Pam, for joining us. I want to thank the audience so much for coming, yeah, for asking everybody. your questions. Uh, Pam, if you could just stick around for one moment. Sure. Um, I'm going to put, if you guys want to come to write with us, with me and Annie Wyman tomorrow to get some writing done at 1 p.m. I'm putting that link in the chat. But it's a community. It is a community. Show up. That's that's a perfect tie-in to find some people. Uh, yeah. And, and communicate and, and work on your writing together. So thank you again so much, everyone. Have a fantastic evening or morning, depending where you are in the world. And happy writing, everybody.